Club, Minister for Home Affairs and Cybersecurity, Claire O'Neill. She'll outline the Labor government's plans to reform Australia's migration system, which the minister has described as broken. Claire O'Neill with today's National Press Club address. and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. My name is Laura Tingle and I'm the club's president. Migration is one of the defining features of Australia's culture, one of the drivers of our economy, and unfortunately in recent decades, a political football too often used in our culture wars. It's also a discussion that is a bit stuck in the past. We still see hot debates about whether the annual intake of migrants should be 10 or 20,000 people higher or lower in any given year, when literally millions of people in Australia now are here as temporary, but often permanently temporary, migrants making up 7% of the population. Our speaker today is seeking to not just clean up the migration system, but re-establish some clearer ambitions for migration that make it work for the country and migrants. Please join me in welcoming Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill to address us. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Press Club. And thank you to you, those of you here in this room and those watching at home, for giving your time for what is a really important conversation for our country. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have been the traditional owners of the land around Canberra for 50,000 years. It is impossible for us to tell a story about Australia without acknowledging our ancient beginnings. And it is impossible to tell a story about Australia without talking about migration. We are a proud migrant nation. Half of Australia's citizens were born overseas or have a parent who was born overseas. Together, as one but many, we have built the most prosperous, safe, cohesive country in the world. And every Australian is entitled to be proud about that. And to feel confident that we can, that we can tackle what's coming at us in the difficult decades ahead. One of the really remarkable things about our country is that when we confront crisis and challenge, we use those moments to build a better nation for the next generation. And in doing so, migration has been one of our most important tools. In the 1940s, a gutsy Ben Chifley warned that we must populate or perish. And the migrants who answered that call set the foundation for two decades of growth that delivered life-changing prosperity for Australian families. In the 1970s, Gough Whitlam blew open the dusty doors of power to bury the white Australia policy and welcome migrants from around the world. 50 years later, multiculturalism is still central to our Australian identity. In the 1990s, Paul Keating used skilled migration to drive Australia out of recession. Migration helped deliver the longest period of continuous economic growth in recorded history anywhere in the world, in our country, Australia. Today, I want to have a conversation about migration which is direct and honest. In each of these historic instances, migration helped us become a more prosperous and secure Australia because the system was designed to meet the challenges of the moment. And that is not true of our system today. I would challenge anyone in this room to explain what national problems our migration system is seeking to solve. Our migration system is suffering from a decade of genuinely breathtaking neglect. It is broken, it is failing our businesses, it is failing migrants themselves, and most important of all, it is failing Australians. And that cannot continue because we as a country face some big national challenges that migration can help us resolve. Our economy is stuck in a productivity rut and Australians are suffering because of it. Migration can help us change that. We are the developed country most at risk of a warming climate 
but also the nation with most to gain from the transition to a net zero economy. But we need skills to help us be able to do it. We confront the most challenging geopolitical circumstances since the 1940s. Our country needs to build better sovereign capabilities and we need to do it fast. Our ageing population will demand more workers in health and aged care than our domestic population will be able to provide. Migration will never substitute our laser focus on skilling Australians. It is not the full answer to any of the problems that I've described, but it is part answer for all of them. If populate or perish described Australia's challenge in the 1950s, skill up or sink is the reality that we face in the 2020s and beyond. Because today we aren't bringing in the talent that we need to confront these challenges and we certainly are not making the most of the talent that we've got. The solution to this is to end the era of policy neglect and laziness, where the system has basically run itself. It means being strategic and decisive and purposeful about who we need to help us meet the challenges of the moment and how we will make sure that we get the best out of them. Since coming to government, my friend and colleague, Minister Andrew Giles, and I have been very focused on this enormous challenge. And in November last year, we asked former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Dr Martin Parkinson, to work with two of Australia's foremost migration experts, Professor Joanna Howe and John Azarius, to help our government get this system working in our national interest. And today we have released their report. Martin, Joe and John brought deep expertise and commitment to this work. It has been essential to us, particularly the report's clear articulation of objectives and guardrails, and I thank them for their work. Today, I am also releasing a draft outline of a new migration strategy for Australia built in the national interest. This document outlines a series of directions for significant reform of this system, which we will work on, consult on and refine before we release a final strategy later this year. So today, I want to do two very simple things. I want to explain what is going wrong in our migration system and how our government plans to fix it. The first big problem is that our migration system today is not delivering Australia the skills we need for the challenges that I have set out. Who we invite to come and join us in our national endeavours is one of the most important questions that the Australian government asks on behalf of its people. It is a question that deserves care and love and attention. But over the last decade, it has been treated with disgraceful neglect. Australia's historic migration success has been rooted in permanency and citizenship. We give people the opportunity to get established in our community, to educate their children and to become Australian. Today, our system is dominated by a large temporary migration program, and that program is not well designed. The tools which are meant to help us ensure that the temporary migrants that come here have the skills that we need is broken and back the front. To determine skills needs, we use outdated occupation lists that don't reflect the needs of the economy and labour market testing that both business and unions agree isn't working. And the effect of many of these rules is that we're missing out on the highly skilled workers that we need. We use an income threshold to define temporary workers who come here as skilled. The idea is that they're here because they're bringing to our country things that Australians can't do. Almost 10 years ago, that threshold was frozen by the former government at $53,900. That, of the, of the, that is below the earnings of 90% of Australia's full-time workers. So what that means is that every year for the last decade, a growing share of people entering Australia on temporary skilled visas are being funnelled into low-wage jobs. Under Peter Dutton, in his long-term role as Immigration and Home Affairs Minister in our country, our skilled worker program morphed into a guest worker program. What he created was an immigration system which favoured temporary migration and increasingly lower paid jobs. And these are the two essential ingredients to the worker exploitation that we know is occurring in Australian workplaces. 
International students are a very important part of this puzzle. We are incredibly privileged in Australia to train many young people in our brilliant universities and colleges. Those students are meant to come here to study. And the bar that we set for their entry is simply whether they will be able to perform in Australia's education system. The problem is that today, international students are the largest component of our temporary migration program and the single biggest feeder into our permanent program. More than half of the people who received a permanent skilled visa under our current system arrived in Australia initially as an international student. The links between our temporary and permanent migration programs aren't working. The formula that we use to determine which temporary migrants get the chance to become permanent residents and eventually a citizen doesn't help us select for the skills and capacities we need to build Australia's future. So the upshot is this. Australia's migration system has today become dominated by a very large, poorly designed temporary program which is not delivering the skills we need to tackle urgent national challenges and that program creates the essential ingredients for the exploitation of migrant workers. The second problem I want to explain is how our migration system turned into a bureaucratic nightmare. Our system is slow and crazily complex, and this has real consequences for the quality of our migration program. We have hundreds of visa categories and subcategories. It is a mess of three-digit visa codes, the 186, the 864, the 408, so complicated that if I drew you a diagram, it would look like a tangled bowl of spaghetti. We have a visa class for just about everything, including one specifically for the crew of super yachts. And we add to that more than 1,300 separate labour agreements, tailoring these visas to specific circumstances. We add rigid occupation lists which are incapable of adjusting fast enough, especially for growing industries like the tech sector, and an achingly slow process to recognise skills and qualifications earned in other country. And what you get is a system that is heaving with rules, forms and bureaucracy. Large businesses that have massive HR departments find the migration system impossible to navigate. And small businesses have got Buckley's chance of being able to use it to fill a skills gap. For migrants, the consequence is paying exorbitant fees to migration agents just so they can navigate the system. And these problems are much more than just an irritation. Remember that other developed countries are competing for the same migrants that we need here in Australia, for aged care nurses, for engineers, for tech experts. The complexity and delay can put them off Australia altogether. Professor Brian Schmidt is the Vice Chancellor of Australian National University and one of the finest minds of his generation. He came to Australia in the 1990s and he was granted a visa in four days. Today's world-leading young astrophysicist would wait many months just to get an answer out of our current system, and that's if she or he were lucky and could find their occupation on the rigid skills list. So we can probably assume that today's Brian Schmidt would take their Nobel Prize and move to Canada instead. And that is a national tragedy, that because of our migration system, this is probably happening to us all the time. Our migration program is also failing once migrants have arrived in Australia. Worker exploitation hurts our migrants and it hurts Australians. It is completely contrary to Australian values and I do not know a single person who would defend it. And yet, we all know this is happening. So going forward, we need to design out the opportunity from this system to exploit migrants as much as we can. I said up front that our migration program was unstrategic and unplanned, and there is no better example of that than in our housing market. Our country faces genuine and significant challenges providing safe, affordable housing for Australians. These problems are not caused by migrants. There are hundreds of thousands of fewer migrants in the country now than there would have been had we not shut the borders due to COVID and yet we are still facing these very substantial difficulties with housing. Our housing problem in Australia is the fault of 10 years of gross inaction 
by a federal government that never had a serious housing policy, not for a day. And the fact that there is no way for our three levels of government to work together to plan for housing, services and infrastructure needs that result from population changes. A final failure I want to mention is that our migration system is not aligned with Australian values. First, integrity. Because the former government was asleep at the wheel, abuse of our visa system has gone unchecked. We need more resources in home affairs focused on ensuring that migrant ex worker exploitation is identified and addressed. Second, fairness. Too many migrants are stuck in permanently temporary limbo. And third, inclusion. There is a big opportunity for us here to tap the potential of people who are already here in our country, such as migrant women who are being held back by slow and tedious skills recognition processes. So let me summarise the four problems I've talked about. We have just lived through a wasted decade where continental drift and passivity have allowed Australia's migration system to deteriorate. What has emerged is a system where it is increasingly easy for migrants to come to Australia in search of a low paid job, but increasingly difficult for migrants with the skills that we desperately need. Our migration system is ridiculously complex, making the system difficult to use, which deters the people that we need the most. We're not doing enough to plan for and look after migrants when they arrive, and we need to restore Australian values to the heart of this system. We've been in government now for almost a year, and in that time, we have made enormous progress on some of the most acute problems facing this system. Minister Andrew Giles has done absolutely tremendous work dramatically reducing the one million long visa backlog. Healthcare workers are now getting their visas processed in one day. We are changing the culture and dynamic in our department, giving more resources to this part of home affairs and bringing migration right back into the centre of what we do. Business and unions welcomed a larger permanent skilled migration program last year to help us deal with what was the worst labour shortage that we have experienced since the Second World War. That included 34,000 skilled migrants that settled in our regions where there are particular shortages. In February, we delivered on an election commitment to provide permanent visa pathways for approximately 20,000 existing temporary protection visa and safe haven enterprise visa enterprise visa holders. And last week, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced that as of July 1 this year, New Zealanders living in Australia will have a pathway to Australian citizenship just as Australians do when they live in New Zealand. New Zealanders are the single largest group of permanently temporary migrants in Australia, treating them in the same respectful way that Australians are treated when they live in New Zealand is the right thing to do and it is very important to the relationship between our two countries. Today I'm proposing directions for a significant reform of our migration system. Our overall goal is to end a decade of ad hoc and piecemeal changes to this system and embark on a genuine reform that will set us up for a more prosperous and secure Australia in the 2020s and beyond. First, we need to fix the biggest problem we have, that is redesigning the system to get the skills here that we need. We have begun consultation on a proposal to restructure our temporary skilled migration program to make sure that this system is delivering the skills that we need to take our nation forward. The draft outline of the Australian migration strategy that I'm releasing today proposes that we consider three new pathways for temporary skilled migrants to come to our country, tightly tailored to the needs we have out of this system. The first is a pathway which is fast and simple for the specialised, highly skilled workers we need to drive innovation in our economy and help us build the jobs of the future. The second is a mainstream skilled pathway to bring in the core skills we need. So for this stream, we would focus on proper evidence-based assessments of labour shortages rather than the current outdated approaches that everyone agrees are not working. This pathway would include skilled migrants who are earning above an increased temporary skilled migration income threshold to make sure that when we say we're bringing skilled people into the country, that is actually what we're doing. And the third stream relates to essential industries. 
One of the reasons there is so much exploitation in Australia is because we have allowed low-wage migration programs to operate in the shadows, for example, through exploitation of our international student visa system. And this has allowed areas of the economy that rely on these workers to either um, create massive opportunities for exploitation or subject those sectors to ongoing chronic labour shortages which put enormous pressure on the people that work in them. So instead of pretending that some students are here to study when they are actually here to work, we need to look at creating proper, capped, safe, tripartite pathways for workers in key sectors such as care. Not only would this provide better support for those industries, it would provide far greater protections for the workers that we depend on. We will propose to reform the way we determine which temporary migrants end up as permanent residents and ultimately citizens. And a critical change here is how we design what is called the points test. Now this may sound a little bit boring and technical, but it is absolutely crucial. Every year, our country selects roughly 100,000 permanent residents using the points test. By 2050, it is, possible, it is possible that we will have millions of additional people here who have been selected using this test, but the current test is not working properly. The bar is set too low, and today the points test rewards persistence, not the skills we need for Australia's future. Getting that points test right could add tens of billions of dollars to the federal budget over the coming decades and make a real difference to economic growth in our country. And Australia needs to enter the competition for global talent. We need to make a big switch in our thinking from the passivity that drives the system today to active engagement with the people we think can help build our country's future. We propose creating a new area in the Home Affairs Department, which will work with the new Jobs and Skills Australia body that has been established by our government to help identify skills needs in Australia's economy. And under this proposal, we would go out into the world and find the migrants that Australia needs and talk to them about joining us in our national journey. I've spoken a little bit about the terrible complexity in this current system. And one thing we absolutely do not need is more forms and bureaucracy. We need a proper data-driven approach to migration that will help us do away with a lot of the red tape that's in the system at the moment. Under the proposed pathway, Jobs and Skills Australia, which is a body that our government has set up, will be given a formal role in our migration system for the first time. So working with clear guidance and input from both business and unions, Jobs and Skills Australia will use facts and data to prove out where labour shortages exist. And Jobs and Skills Australia will help us properly integrate the jobs market, our training and education systems and our migration system for the very first time. So that when we face these labour shortages as a country, there's actually a cohesive approach to thinking about how we will get the skills we need. Our migration system should never be a substitute for skilling local workers but it can complement Australian workers and Jobs and Skills Australia can make sure that we do this properly. Part of our work will also be simplifying our visa system with the aim to strongly reduce the number of visa categories. There is just no need for things to be this complicated. I've spoken a bit about how we will change our migration system to ensure that we are getting the people here that we need. But we also need to make sure that we're getting the right outcomes for migrants and for Australians on the ground. And part of this will involve much closer collaboration with the states. While the federal government controls our migration settings, a real partnership with states and territories is going to be crucial to us getting this system right. And the fact that there is actually no genuine mechanism at the moment for us to plan for population changes as a country is a bit startling. Tomorrow, when National Cabinet meets, the Prime Minister will begin a conversation about how we can work together better as a federation to plan for housing and services and infrastructure. This will build on the incredible work that my colleagues Jim Chalmers and Julie Collins have done with the Housing Accord. Ensuring that we get the right outcomes on the ground also means looking after the migrants who are here properly. And to do this, we need to reform the policy settings that drive exploitation. 
That means exploring ways to give migrants more flexibility to move employers and to enforce their workplace rights. A big focus of our efforts is going to be how we manage international students in the migration system. We want to ensure that high performing students with the skills we need are given a proper chance to stay in Australia. We propose creating faster, simpler pathways for the international students who have special skills and capabilities that we need. But we also need to make sure that our international student system has integrity. So working with my colleagues, Ministers Brendan O'Connor and Jason Clare, we are looking at tightening the requirements for international students studying in Australia to ensure that students who are here are actually here to study. Strengthening how the international student system and the migration systems interact will be a very substantial piece of work that we will share more information on in the coming months. Finally, um, a big change we need to make is to restore Australian values to the heart of this system. And I want, about, I want to talk quickly about three of those values. So the first is integrity. Without integrity, we will lose public confidence in this system. We can guarantee that. And we can strengthen integrity by improving post-arrival monitoring and enforcement of wages and conditions to make sure that we detect and prevent exploitation. And it will mean better regulation of migration agents. The second is fairness. Fundamentally, this is about ending permanent temporariness and making sure that migrant workers can exercise their rights. As I mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of work already on this, really clearing two of the largest caseloads in that big temporary, permanently temporary backlog. But we need to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. So we need to avoid policies and conditions that essentially give rise to people moving just from visa to visa to visa and never understanding really whether they'll get that chance to stay in Australia. So that means clearer pathways for the skilled workers we need, but also clarity for the migrants that have less of a chance of becoming a permanent resident over time. And the third value is inclusion. And we can do this by improving and streamlining skills recognition to help more migrants, including those secondary applicants, those partners of the primary migrant, to enter the labour market at a level that matches their qualification. Our government is today making a commitment and proposing a pathway to fixing Australia's migration system. And we're not just proposing a pathway and a plan. We're going to put a down payment on the system that we want to build by taking a first set of actions in the federal budget. And I want to announce two of those actions today. First, as of July 1, the temporary skilled migration income threshold, also known as the TISMET, will increase from $53,900 to $70,000. This is the first increase in TISMET in a decade, and it is a big deal. The Grattan Institute calls $70,000 the Goldilocks threshold. We call it essential to ensuring this program is what it says it is, a skilled worker program, not a guest worker program. Second, I can announce that as of the end of 2023, the end of this year, all skilled temporary workers will have a pathway to permanent residency. This does not mean an expansion of our CAPT program. It does not mean more people. It simply means that a group of temporary workers who have been denied even the opportunity to apply for permanent residency will be able to do so. We actually want, as a country, to um, increase competition for those precious permanent residency places, and we don't want to leave more workers in limbo, simply bouncing from visa to visa with no end in sight. These two changes show we're serious about the reform agenda ahead. And I hope that as I finish up today, you have a clear sense of what a new migration system for our country would look like. I've spoken a lot about what's going wrong with Australia's migration system today, and there are many, many problems. But what I am genuinely much more excited about is the big opportunity. We have every reason to be optimistic about our country's future and every reason to believe that our migration system can help us deliver a more secure and prosperous Australia, as it has done for us so many times in the past. We are a truly great country with a fundamentally broken migration system. So just imagine what we will be able to achieve when we get this powerful engine working again in the national interest. Thanks, Laura.
that's it for me. Thanks so much, Minister. Um, if we could talk about that huge um, sort of uh, swing instrument, shall we say, of uh, international students. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain for people who don't know how the system works, if you're an international student at the moment, uh, what do you have to do to uh, transfer to being in this skilled migrant program? Um, and at what point does that um, income threshold you know, where does that uh, sort of come into play? What, what, how, and how is your proposal for a change going to um, change the number of students who effectively are staying on in Australia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a long one, Laura. <laughs> I'll try yes. to keep it as short as I can. Yes, sorry, I'm um, setting so a bad example. <laughs> could I say, firstly, um, our international education market is incredibly important to our economy. It's, it's actually just important to the, to the education system that we run in our country. This is our fourth largest export, and it's one that we're very proud of. What we want to make sure, and I know the university sector and the training sector are with me here, we've got to make sure this is a system with integrity. Otherwise, we degrade not only the experience of students here, but actually our reputation around the region and internationally. So it's really important that we get this right. So some of the problems that I talked about, um, I'll, I'll just recap a little bit. So I think the first issue is that we are assessing international students based on whether we think that they will be able to essentially survive in Australia's education system. So it is quite a low bar to set, appropriately, because they're here to learn and we want to help them build their skills. The issue is that this has become the dominant feeder into our permanent program. So we've set a low bar. We have a broken test that converts um, someone from a te temporary to a permanent migrant. And this is basically um, part of the dynamic that's a bit broken at the moment. So you asked about, um, you asked about the, the, um, the income threshold that I mentioned. So this will be very relevant because at the moment um, you can transition onto a temporary skilled visa off a student visa if you're earning $53,900 a year, which as I explained is a lower income than 90% of Australia's full-time workers when this is meant to be a skilled program. So by lifting the TISMET, we are restoring significantly the integrity of this skilled worker program um, and making sure that the people who are here are actually going to be in our workplaces helping lift the productivity and the capacity of Australian workers. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from The Australian. The care industry has been a big focus of uh, your speech today, um, which makes sense. Of course, there's a lot of challenges, particularly in aged care. Is there anything in the very near term that you will do, that you plan to do, to make it easier for migrants to work in aged care and ensure more migrants are coming, mm -hmm. given that by the middle of this year we have that quite large uh, goal to have the 24-7 nursing mm -hmm. that a lot of uh, centres are very concerned about? Are you going to do anything before then? Is anything going to change before then to really address those concerns? Yeah, OK, thank you, Sarah. So firstly, critically important problem for the country. We have the, um, the oldest of the baby boomer generation, this largest ever of Australian generations, just starting to um, access aged care supports in our country. And we are already struggling greatly to provide workers. Um, a big part of the puzzle here, if I can just mention, is the, the low pay of aged care workers, and that is something that um, the Fair Work Commission has acted on and our government is addressing. Um, I think even if we do everything around pay and conditions, we are still going to have a shortfall of workers in this sector, and that's why your question is so important. So um, the short answer to what you've asked, are we doing anything about it before we do the big fix? Um, the answer is yes, and I'll let Andrew Giles speak a little bit more about that in the coming weeks. Um, but I think what's really important here is not just thinking about this is a short-term problem. We have a structural issue of workers in our care sector. And one of the reasons that I've talked about restructuring our temporary skilled program is that we need to provide a long-term solution for this, not just see people come in on ad hoc labour agreements and that sort of thing, which is not really going to address this underlying problem for the country. Thank you. Angus Thompson. Minister, thank you. Angus Thompson from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, can you explain why the government hasn't uh, raised a TISMIT to above 90,000, uh, given that's what the ACTU has called for, and even I think the BCA have called for a figure in, in that range as well? Yeah, OK. So um, that's not quite right. So the BCA, um, the figure was substantially lower than 70,000. So um, I think that's why the Grattan Institute calls this the Goldilocks threshold. It's, uh, it's just about right. 
Um, you're right, there were advocates in the discussion calling for a significantly higher TISMET. And if I can just explain why 70,000 is the right answer for us. So firstly, 70,000 is what the rate would have been had it not been frozen back at the 2013 rate. So essentially it would have just tracked up to around 70,000. Um, but the other thing that's really important here is um, that a lot of skilled workers who are coming to our country are quite a bit younger. And what we will inevitably do if we set this rate too high is exclude these younger people who are coming under the temporary skilled program at the moment. So um, what we need to do is make a program that's going to be fit for purpose for those younger people. They're not always coming in at the very top of the labour market, but they're still bringing in skills that we really need. So I think that's why we've made the move to 70,000. Andrew Thank Proben. You. Minister, as you were referencing in your speech, 54% of permanent resident visas are mm -hmm. given to uh, former international students. Um, but alarmingly, more than half of them end up working in the two mm. lowest skilled areas. How do you fix this without discouraging or maybe forcing universities to only offer university places in skills we actually need, rather than allowing universities to treat uni uh, international students mm -hmm. as cash cows? Uh -huh. I'll just leave that last <laughs> value comment for someone else to react to. Um, so a, a couple of things are important in what you've raised. Um, so international students should be allowed to come to Australia. We love having them here and they're an essential part of our society and our economy and that's a really good thing. I think the real question for us is what role do we want international students to play feeding into our skilled program and then ultimately to our permanent program? And one of the really significant issues here is I've talked about passivity. This is a really good example. We've basically sat back and allowed the people who are already here to run, you know, run through the system. And that's why the proposal to actually get out and market Australia to the world and talk to people about the beautiful opportunity to come and move here is really important. So raising the tismet will do a lot about this because what it will mean is that if you're in those very low um, wage jobs, you're not going to qualify to come in as a skilled migrant anymore. And I mentioned that um, I'm working with my colleagues Jason Clare and Brendan O'Connor to think about how we would need to lift the requirements for international students to enter and study in Australia. Thanks. Michael Reid. Michael Reid from the AFR. Minister, what kind of skills and experiences will be prioritised uh, and what ones will be deprioritised in a more robust point system? Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking that, Michael, and it, and, it, and it allows me to make a really good point, which is that it, it shouldn't be for the minister to decide what skills shortages there are in the country. Um, this is an evidence-based question that today we don't have a lot of evidence behind. And part of the problem in the system is that um, because the minister essentially does get to decide what a, what a shortfall looks like, you end up with a, a system where, you know, one person's got discretionary decision-making power and, you know, in, in my view, too much control without having the information perhaps that uh, Jobs and Skills Australia will provide. So in terms of um, prioritising and deprioritising, um, what I would say is that we would like to simplify the system. So that would mean that we are going to try to move away from the strictures of occupation lists and have a broader description of skills needs that confront the country. And I can share some of them off the top of my head, which I think would be well known to you as an economic journalist. You know, care, we've talked about a lot. Uh, we've got a significant issue getting tech sector skills into the country. We've got dramatic shortages of engineers. We've got dramatic shortages of people in construction. So I think the broader point is all of us in this room can have a stab at saying what these are. Let's get someone actually to sit down and properly use a data-driven approach to define what they are and to take it perhaps a little bit out of the realm of politics where I fiercely believe it doesn't belong. Thank you, Minister. Jade Galberger. Jade Galberger from the Herald Sun. Minister, thank you for your address. If the government does do all of the things mm. in this strategy, will Australia end up with a larger or smaller migration program? Thanks. That's a great question, Jade. Thank you for raising it. Uh, let me be really clear. Um, what I've talked about today is not about more people. And you asked what would happen if we implemented all the things I've discussed. The consequence of that would be a smaller migration program for the country. Tom McConnell. 
Tom Connell from Sky News. Just following on from the end of your answer to uh, my good colleague Andrew Probin, so it, it sounds as though there'll be what restrictions on universities in, in terms of who they can bring in or, or new levels of requirement. And what sort of degrees at the moment are people coming here and studying for that we really don't need? Okay, um, thanks, Tom. So um, the second question I might I might leave to the experts. I think there's a lot that's been written about this problem, and you can um, have a look at what the experts are saying. Are the, the areas where we might see a little a few issues? Um, I think what we're really talking about here is making sure that the international student education system is doing what it says on the label, and that is educating brilliant young minds from around the region that Australia is very proud to do. Now, that's not always the case today with the education um, system, and so I'm working with Jason Clare and Brendan O'Connor to bring forward a series of reforms that will see us ensure that that system is principally about education, as it says, and we're just not ready quite yet to share the detail with you, but we'll come, I'll come on your show, Tom, as soon as we are. <laughs> that, I like that commitment. A super quick follow-up. Would the number change or just about the type of people? So, um, I mean, this is not about um, reducing the number, but I think it's inevitable when we lift standards that there may be some implications for numbers. But that's not the target of this. The, the, the target of this project is making sure that we have the skills in our country that we need to meet national challenges. Charles Croucher. Charles Croucher from Nine. Minister, you've spoken about the need for uh, increased monitoring, increased education, increased enforcement. How many more people are going to be needed in your department to do all these things? And given the exploitation going on, does there need to be increased punishments or new legislation to prevent what's clearly apparent? Yeah, great. Thank you, Charles. Really, really important questions. Um, my colleague Andrew Giles is going to have a lot more to say about this in the coming weeks, so I might leave those details to him. But I would just say that we have come into government with a really fierce commitment to addressing some of these issues. We should not see worker exploitation in a country like Australia. It is, there is no country in the world where the values are more betrayed by this practice. And um, so I'll, I'll allow Minister Giles to share some details with you in the coming weeks, but the commitment is real. Finn McHugh. Finn McHugh, SBS News. Minister, thanks for your speech. On a different topic, a couple of months ago you took the quite unusual step of naming Iran as the country mm. behind a foreign interference plot in Australia, as what you said was the beginning of an open conversation on foreign interference. The speech noticeably didn't mention China at a time that your government's obviously seeking to unthaw relations. I'm wondering if those two things are linked, and going forward when it comes to naming and shaming, how much will you factor in things like trade and bilateral relations? Thank you. The speech didn't mention China because it was a speech about Iran, so I hope, uh, I hope that's clear. If you look at the speech, it's actually quite specifically about issues facing our Iranian community here in Australia, which are very real. Um, what I would say is that um, the discussion about foreign interference, in my view, was widely politicised by the former government to the detriment of um, the lives of diaspora communities in our country, which are very important. And um, I don't intend to do that as Home Affairs Minister. I will call out foreign interference when it is in the national interest to do so, and I will continue to do that as I progress in my role. Uh, we started with Iran, but you probably also noticed in that speech I talked about the work we are doing to develop an attribution framework for this. So this is not the ad hoc decision of the Minister, but something that is a structured and thoughtful exercise. Melissa Code. Hi, Minister. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. My question is about uh, regional Australia, mm -hmm. which was also mentioned in Dr Parkinson's report. And it talked about how the really sort of complex way that states, territories and, and the federal government work together in inputting where those uh, skills shortages and needs are and how the migration system adequately responds to it is, is a big problem. Um, given migration is such a political issue, as well as the economic sustainability of regional Australia, um, what do you envisage this strategy will do to keep the politics out of what say the states and territories have in those mm -hmm. policy levers? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. What, a, what an important question. So I, I think that one of the under-discussed topics in this area is about the geographic dimensions of migration. And, um, you know, we see sometimes quite fast population growth in our cities, but um, real issues around population decline in regions and the bush. 
and this is something that sort of exercises the government because when you think about something like aged care, those needs are not just in the city. We actually need to have some um, distribution of workers. So one of the things that um, the report that Martin and Joe and um, John released, um, it talks about the um, vexed history of trying to drive population through the migration system and to just cut it short. This is something that Australian governments have been trying to do for many, many decades and it's tended not to be very successful. And the reason it hasn't been successful is because it hasn't been um, a collaboration with states and territories and it hasn't been a cohesive approach. You can't just direct you know, 500 migrants to go and live in a place where there aren't services and there aren't, you know, religious institutions that they desire and there aren't schools for their children. Um, so part of the purpose of the Prime Minister trying to lead a better discussion with the states is to try to start to think about these issues as they belong, which is as a whole. So we won't be solving that problem through the migration system, but we are ready to work with states and territories on this problem um, in a cohesive manner that will provide proper support to new entrants. Ben Westcott. Hello, Minister. Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you for your speech. Um, uh, in his review, Martin Parkinson was uh, reasonably critical of the investor class visa. Mm -hmm. He said there were some issues there. Um, is that something that you would be looking to reform or alter in some way? Mm -hmm. So um, we are looking at this at the moment, and I think there's some big opportunities here in this set of classes that's essentially being created to try to um, enhance investment in Australia. One of the things I would just mention is that most of those visas were created at a time where Australia was a net importer of capital. And actually, in the last 10 years, that's changed quite significantly um, for various reasons. We have uh, quite a lot of capital here domestically. Um, so we're thinking about that at the moment. What I would say is that um, I think there are integrity issues at the moment with some of these visas that we need to look at and there's room for improvement. So it is part of the reform project. I just didn't mention it in the speech because there's a bit going on. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Carp has a question. Thanks very much for your speech, Minister. Um, the review talks about shifting from an exclusive focus on the permanent migration cap to considering uh, net overseas mm -hmm. migration. Um, if 1.8 million people um, being here, you know, per permanently temporary is too many, is mm. the government going to uh, set a target for what that figure should be and what, what do you think it should be? Um, so, Paul, thank you for your question. Um, so, the, the mm. government is talking with the states and territories tomorrow about thinking about this program as a whole and I very much agree with the reviewers there. Um, Laura, you mentioned in your opening that there's virtually obsessive focus on the number of permanent um, visa holders that we grant each year, while all the while we've got people coming and going um, that aren't sort of accounted for or thought about or talked about. And I think that will change. I do think that will change as a consequence of this. So I think overall we absolutely believe in better planning for the migration output as a whole for the country. And that's why the Prime Minister is trying to work better with the states and territories to think about how we are going to plan for whatever the numbers are. And just in terms of your, your question about what's desirable, um, for me, quantity is not the, the really important question here. I think most of the migration debates that I've observed as an Australian have become virtually obsessed with big Australia or small Australia and you've got to push yourself into one of those dichotomies. I think inevitably the size of this program does depend a little bit on the circumstances of the moment. In COVID, it was right to shut the borders and our migration rate was effectively zero. Coming out of COVID, we are playing a bit of catch up. We've got serious labour shortages and it's probably inevitable that we will run a slightly larger migration program over time. My desire is to see that program tightened and potentially smaller into the medium term. And most of the proposals that I've talked about today will assist us in doing that. Sarah Besford Canales. Thank you, Minister. Sarah Basford canales from the Canberra Times. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on the um, bureaucratic nightmare um, that migrants have to face in order, in order to get to Australia. It's obviously one of the first things they really see about Australia. Um, the review heavily uh, criticises the Home Affairs Department's IT system, mm. calling them cumbersome, overly complex, and the result of successive governments trying to fix these solutions with Big Bang. Um, approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, how will the federal government fix the years long issue if Big Bang solutions haven't worked in the past? Thank you. And this is really, really central. Um, I, I, I really want people to understand how much the administration of this system is actually creating poor outcomes for the country. And the, the IT system is one of those. Um, I have sat with 
visa processes in the Home Affairs Department and honestly, like hats off to these people. They are working between, you know, four or five different computer programs, cutting and pasting things, retyping things. Like you would not believe the state of this IT. It is a real issue. Something that um, the report talked about was the fact that attempts have been made to deal with this IT problem before we've actually defined what the migration system should look like, and that's not very smart. We need to deal with the reform exercise first. There will be um, an IT um, project that comes out of this, whether it's small or large. I'm not sure about that yet. Um, but I think the most important thing for us right now is what do we want our migration system to achieve? How do we establish that in public policy? And then we think about the IT that will um, ultimately need to back that up. Thank you. Brandon Howe. Hi, Minister. Brandon Howe from innovationalls.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to follow up on the question on the ICT systems, I was just wondering if you could provide a bit more detail on why the government uh, acts the most recent attempt to reform uh, the permissions capability back in August 2022. Mm -hmm. And are you able to give a timeline on when we could see the yeah. next ICT project? Yeah, well, we axed the permissions capability because the project was a disaster. Um, and so it, it did need to be, it did need to not proceed, if I can um, try to be polite about that. Um, not very successfully, obviously. Um, so that, 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 that's sort of done and dealt with. We're moving forward now. As I said, we need to actually define, we need to solve the policy question first. The reason that we have had basically endless attempts to digitise this system that haven't quite worked is because no one's done the hard thinking yet about what, our, we, what, what we want our migration system to achieve and what such a system would look like. Then we think about the processes that sit underneath that. So it's a sequencing exercise and we are trying to break off this big chunk first, which is asking the difficult question, what do we want this system to achieve and how are we going to make it do it? Do you have an indication of how long that process might take? Not at this stage, no. Julie here. Hi, Julie here from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, thank you for your speech. My question also goes to international students. Mm -hmm. um, you say that you want to ensure that the students who come here are actually here to study. They have to sign a genuine student test at the moment, but everyone knows it's fast. Um, the strategy also, your strategy actually talks about IELTS, um, the English language testing, mm -hmm. and whether the, the thresholds are high enough. Um, and I'm just also wondering, you talk about the better regulation of migration agents. Yeah. Does that also deal better regulation of education agents? I guess my point goes, is to the point that while you talk about exploitation of international students, there is also exploitation here, especially among education agents mm. of international students on shore mm -hmm. and their intentions of coming here. Mm -hmm. And so that means you're going to have to manage who comes in the front door yep. better. So could you just explain to me how that's going to happen? Yep, sure. So um, you raise a really important point, and for a lot of people who don't know this system particularly well, there's a um, there's a, a set of migration agents who are helping people navigate our migration system and then there are education agents who are trying to connect um, students from around the world into our education system. I think there are some issues with both of the ways that those groups are managed and we are looking at that as part of this um, project with Brendan O'Connor and Jason Clare. One of the things that's really important to me and I know to them is that um, we don't, you know, convey only negativity about this sector. This is a hugely important thing for our country. We should be so proud of what is happening in international education in our country and fixing these integrity issues will help us bolster what's working at the moment. So it's going to be a big and important project thinking about lifting standards for international students, how we can ensure that students who are here to study are actually here to study uh, and making sure that um, we think about the uh, pieces of the puzzle that are facilitating exploitation and education agencies in the mix there. Thank you. John Keogh. Thanks. John Keogh from the Financial Review Minister. Um, with the new higher $70,000 TISMIT, will it be indexed annually? And if so, what will be indexed to? And what will happen to the people currently earning, say, around $53,900? Are they going to have to get a nice big $16,000 pay rise to stay here or be some sort of grandfathering arrangement for them? Yep. So the grandfathering arrangement will be when their visa expires and they have to apply for a new visa and that visa will have a, um, an income threshold of $70,000. Um, sorry, um, what was your first question, John? Indexing. Uh, will be yeah, so we, we, haven't, we haven't decided to index at this stage, but this is in the discussion of the, the broader sort of package of measures about how we think about that temporary program. But a lot of decisions to make about the temporary skilled migration program. We are proposing this three-tiered model 
um, it's a very big thing for the country to do a pretty significant transformation compared to what's there at the moment. So we need to look at long term the role of Tismet in that whole conversation under a new system. Mandy Lee. Dear Minister, so you didn't mention about the Beninese investment visa. So my question is that, so will the Beninese investment visa subclass 18H ABC be removed in the future? Mm -hmm. And also for the existing Beninese investment visa applicants, so will you consider to speed the time processing time in the next uh, financial year? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So um, for those of you that aren't as, as attuned to this policy subject, the, the business investment visas is part of this broader class with the significant investor visa, uh, which was designed to bring um, capital and entrepreneurs to our country. And there are some quite on the record sort of significant issues with those. We haven't said that we will abolish those programs. What we have said is that they do need a radical restructure as part of the work that we are doing. And I think this needs to be folded into the broader conversation about um, highly skilled people who we see as creating the jobs of the future for Australians and how we manage them in our migration system. So it's not just about what's called BIP and CIV. This is just the world of acronyms that I live in. It's not just about BIP and CIV, it's about the whole question of that, um, you know, really kind of drivers of economic growth and how we should think about bringing those people into our country. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Anna Henderson. Anna Henderson from SBS and NITV. Uh, Minister, in relation to the Pacific labour migration part of this mm -hmm. review, there's a concern raised about some Pacific governments that are worried that communities will be emptied of prime age workers. I'm quoting from the report there across all skill levels. What is our ethical obligation to our mm -hmm. Pacific partners to not allow that to happen? Yeah, so it's, a, it's big and it's important. Um, the, the Pacific scheme is, um, is something that we as a country conduct because it's beneficial to our country but also to Pacific Island nations. Um, so obviously the government takes incredibly seriously any concerns that are raised around um, that not working for our partner countries. That's not the desire at all. This is meant to be a win-win um, for, for both countries. And I think generally it is. I think there are some instances where there have been issues. But if you don't mind, I might just leave that one for Penny Wong and Pat Conroy because that program is actually run through the um, DFAT department. So it doesn't actually sit neatly in the, in the migration system in the way that other things do. Hmm. I understand. But as Home Affairs Minister, does there need to be some kind of balance where, you know, only a proportion of people from a community are attracted to Australia at any one time. Yeah, again, sorry, not, not trying to be irritating and avoid your question, but the design of this program belongs to the Foreign Minister and the Assistant Foreign Minister. Their goal is to ensure that we build and strengthen our partnership with Pacific Island countries, and they're really focused on that at the moment, so I'd just direct that question towards them. Thank you. Nick Stewart. Your immigration minister, so you've obviously got some idea of the total number that we're talking about. Uh, the, you've said you want quality. Does that mean, as Kevin Rudd might have said, we want 50 million quality, intelligent people in Australia? 40 million? 30 million? Mm -hmm. what, what sort of number do you think Australia can cope with overall? Mm -hmm. So it's an important question, but one that I'm not here to express a view on today. Um, it's really important to me that we can have a conversation about migration policy in our country, which is not just reduced to the size of the population. There are lots of important questions in migration that aren't to do with population, but are about who we bring here and why. Um, so these are the questions that I'm trying to answer, um, not so much on the population side. So who's looking at the total population? Well, uh, the, the population... Whose responsibility would it be? Well, it's not that it's not my responsibility, it's just that I think that really distracts from the issues that we're here to talk about today, which is a migration system that is fundamentally broken and not delivering for the country. Thank you. Andrew Tillett. Uh, thank you, Laura. Andrew Tillett from uh, one of the cast of thousands from the Finn here today, <laughs> as, well as, as, Hot topic. as, Hot topic. as, as well as board member here at the press club. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask you a quick... Thank you for rattling through so many questions, by the way. I think we I don't have any choice. So I'm just doing what Laura tells me. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, I just want to ask you a question with your cyber security hat on. Yeah. Um, Australia provided assistance to Ukraine government early on in the war last year with cyber security assistance. There's been mm -hmm. reports this week that um, 
the government has knocked back three several requests from Ukraine for further assistance. Um, can you just explain what the situation is and are we open to providing mm -hmm. further assistance? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So I can't get into the detail on those, but I can say we're open to discussions with Ukraine about how we can help them and we do consider proposals from time to time. As a prize for being such a good answerer of questions... <laughs> um, I'm going to get more. That's you, the, yes, you yep. get the, uh, the President's uh, bonus prize, bonus <laughs> question. Um, well, the two questions, actually. Um, the first one is, um, the, how, how fast do you see the transition um, in the sort of international students' regime, if you like, happening um, uh, in terms of the sort of income threshold, mm -hmm. changing the sort of nature of people coming into the country and therefore affecting the labour market. And a separate question is, one of the issues that has come up is that uh, within the, permanent, within the um, skilled migrant uh, program, the families of skilled migrants mm -hmm. also get counted and basically sort of fill out the program. Are you looking at changing how they're counted? Yeah, great. Thanks, Laura. Um, so, um, so with regard to students, um, so let me just say, it's really important that we move really quickly on this. We don't have time to waste, and with a reform as substantial and all-encompassing as this, you know, this could this this could take a very long time, and I don't want it to. Um, it's really urgent that we fix the problems that we can now, and so what we're working on at the moment is sequencing out how we would. Um, move to the new system as quickly as we can, and it's going to be a piece by piece, not one day we move into a new migration system for the country. So when you talk about students, um, there are some things that are already going to happen which will basically immediately address some of the issues that I've talked about, and the increase to Tismet is the most important there. This is a substantial increase to ensure we have skilled workers coming under a skilled program, and it will have effect effectively from the 1st of July this year. The points test is really, really important. Um, and this is something where I think there's enormous value for the country to be gained and something that can be changed without um, kind of extensive um, systemic um, kind of processes that have to be gone through. So that's something that we're really looking at as a kind of uh, a next cab off the rank to think about how we can make swift changes. The reason that that acts so quickly is that like Tismet, it basically can take effect immediately. So we process um, permanent resident visas all the time, if we change the system, we can choose when it takes effect. So I think those are important things that will improve some of the issues that I've um, talked about with international students. It's really important that we be very careful and consultative in any changes that are being foreshadowed and discussed here. This is a really important sector to our country and it is a great thing that we do in training up so many people in our brilliant education system. And whatever we do with regard to the integrity of it, we've got to make sure that that's not having um, adverse effects that you know, we could have predicted if we'd, if we'd taken our time. So I just say, I want to move really quickly, but we do need to move carefully on this. Um, with regard to your second question, so you, you're right, Laura, um, one of the kind of many um, dirty little secrets of the migration system is that that permanent um, visa list that we create each year actually um, counts family members, which is not, that's not a bad thing, it's just a reflection of that, um, you know, it's a reflection really of how small it is as a part of the overall scope of our migration program. One of the big untapped um, levers that we have here is the capacity of partners who are coming here to contribute to our economy. Um, we can see really clearly in the data that partners of skilled migrants are not engaging with the labour market to the degree that their qualifications suggest that they should be. Um, so part of the reform project that I've talked about today is digging in on that question. It's particularly for migrant women. Often the problem is that they've got skills and qualifications that they earned overseas and we have this very cumbersome process of recognising those qualifications. So that's, that's part of the mix here. So maybe I could just, um, I just um, say one more thing before we, we finish up here. Um, you asked me a question about population. If I can just be a little bit clearer about that. I'm, I'm not someone who advocates for a big Australia in this conversation. What's really important to me is that we've got these big national problems facing our country and we're not getting the right people here through the migration system to help us um, address them. So the focus of this task is not about more people. It's not about a bigger program. And the likely impact of the changes that I've suggested here is probably a slightly smaller migration program over time. But what matters most is what this system is doing for our country. At the moment, it is broken and our government is planning to fix it. Please thank Minister O'Neill for a time today. <laughs>